This week on the agenda, rebuilding trust and reshaping the global economic framework. The big themes here in Davos at the World Economic Forum Annual Meeting 2024. China is growing and open for business. In his keynote speech here in Davos, Premier Li Chang said the country is not a risk, but an opportunity. Look at the Chinese economy like the Alps, he said. To fully appreciate these majestic peaks, we need to zoom out. And that's what investors need to do to get the big picture. China's contribution to global economic growth has remained at around 30 percent. Last year, the Chinese economy rebounded with an estimated growth of around 5.2 percent, beating the 5 percent target set at the beginning of the year. The overarching theme here in Davos is rebuilding trust. And Premier Li Chang voiced his concerns that a real lack of trust was aggravating risks to global growth. I spoke to Gustavo Petro, the president of Colombia, for his thoughts. Y el crecimiento también puede afectar la confianza. Growth can also affect trust, because the fundamental topic that mankind is going through, which is intensifying conflicts, is the climate crisis. And the climate crisis is the result of a type of capitalist growth that is based on an intensive consumption of oil, coal and fossil fuels. And that can lead to barbarism. The consequences of the deepening of the climate crisis can lead to big migrations from the south to the north, the move to the right politically in the north too. The idea that with walls they can defend themselves, the bombing of nations in the south, and we enter what I call the global 1933. 1933 was a year in which Hitler came to power, and it's the beginning of the barbarian times. The discussion here in Davos that I've been trying to promote is that there can be a different road. If we accept the divide between North and South proposed to us here, traditionally what we have seen is that the rich North gives small leftovers to the South, which is very poor, a more barbaric North. We believe that the reality of the climate crisis has changed this situation. And we no longer need the North helping the South, but rather the South helping the North to stop their CO2 emitting chimneys. So when we talk about that widening of the gap between the North and the South that President Xi mentioned, um, do you see that becoming more acute in climate but also in other areas? Undoubtedly, the votes at the United Nations and the case of Palestine are showing that big divide. You have the North on one side, the European Union and the United States with Israel, and the rest of the world on the other side. The large majority of mankind, almost all of Latin America, voted in favor of Palestine. And this is a political divide that can become more acute. Because if we add what happened with COVID, they let the South die while they got vaccinated first. They had a very merchant view of the vaccine when this was about human beings. We see topics like the climate crisis and the Paris Agreement are not being met. The escapism that the North has on its own responsibility regarding the climate crisis. In the North, you have the biggest chimneys of CO2, and we're the ones who are having natural disasters killing people. And the perspective from here forward is that if there's no transformation of the world economic system, at least one billion people of the South will head North. So the possibility of a schism between North and South is possible, and this would just be the beginning of barbarism. That is why I think that we have to find another way. That is to go back to the pact of the agreement of mankind. We need to reduce this border, but that is done transforming dominant current political relationships existing everywhere on the planet. If we were to look at the reality, the current reality from a positive standpoint, we would see that both Africa as well as South America, we have the biggest clean energy production potential in the world. And I said this morning that the chimneys are in the north and the sponges are in the south. 
So there, we have a possibility of an agreement. So last year in Davos, you talked about greening Colombia's economy, and I wonder then if that's still your economic priority. Sí, para mí sí. Además, porque es una oportunidad de prosperidad para Colombia. Yes, because that's an opportunity for prosperity for Colombia. Colombia, like all of South America, has a huge potential in clean energy, sun, wind and green hydrogen, ports, water, and many countries need that. In the Pacific, China to the north and the United States there, we have an opportunity which will lead to decarbonization, and that's what we want for Colombia. Well, you mentioned China, so I'd like to talk about partnerships because you visited Beijing. Um, in October, you went to meet President Xi, and your country's relationship with China has been upgraded to a strategic partnership. How prepared is Colombia for deepening those ties? Digamos, ya, antes de mi gobierno. Well, before my government, before my being responsible, the main works of infrastructure in Bogota, the Colombian capital, are in the hands of Chinese companies, the metro and the tram lines. But I think this could become more national, which is what we have proposed. The transformation of Colombia's transport mobility, which is based on diesel fuel buses, is backwards and ineffective. We need to move it to rail, electric with clean energy. That's one of our objectives. These are no works in the short term, as you can see, but we propose to China to sign an agreement. In fact, there is a current reality, and that is that the lake on which the Panama Canal was built, where the Pacific joins the Atlantic Ocean, is drying out precisely because of the climate crisis. And now many railroads are required that can substitute part of the Panama Canal. Colombia's geography is in the right position to build those railroads. And in a win-win proposal, Colombia could have its own national railroad and China would have its possibilities of trade. So we're working on that. So are you talking about signing up for China's Belt and Road Initiative? China is assessing the possibility. Because it's not about China is assessing the proposal. It's not about us paying for that, because who wins in the first place is China. They are assessing the proposal. One powerful railroad of 150 kilometers could put together the Pacific Ocean with the Atlantic Ocean very close to the Panama Canal. But the largest part of the trade that would go through this railroad would be Chinese trade. So I think that we can enter into a win-win situation in that particular field. Entonces, eh, ahí se puede establecer un gana-gana. Li Chang also made it very clear that as the world enters a new period of turbulence and transformation, increased international collaboration is essential, something Executive Vice President of Global Operations at AstraZeneca, Pam Cheng, wholeheartedly agreed with. I think what the Premier said is absolutely um, on point. I mean, if you think about pharmaceutical supply chain, it really is global in nature, right? If you look, think back about past couple of years with the pandemic and the disruption within the global supply chain, it demonstrates more that we really need that globalization, that smoothing out of supply chain, as he mentioned, to ensure that the patients continue to have access to innovation and the medicines that they need. So we are fully supportive. And how do we ensure that collaboration across the countries, collaboration across the regions on the innovation and, and, and the availability and access to medicines the patients need. He also talked about collaboration in science and technology. And, and in fact, um, AstraZeneca have announced a first in collaboration absolutely. Um, with some other key players. Tell us about that. Yeah, let's do that. So, so we absolutely, within AstraZeneca, we believe in the power of public-private partnerships, particularly when it comes to climate change and fighting climate crisis, which is the biggest public health crisis of our time. Right, you see the disease burdens increasing because of air pollution, because of extreme heat, for example. So we, one of the public-private partnerships we drive is what we call the SMI, 
the Sustainable Market Initiative. There is a Health Systems Task Force, which is chaired by AstraZeneca CEO Pascal Sorio. And recently, we launched a health group within SMI in China. And what we announced this morning, actually fresh uh, off the press, is that we have five global companies coming together, what we call the Power Purchase Agreement. So really partnering with a Chinese company, renewable company called Envision. And what we are doing is really driving that accessibility to renewable energy within China. So this is an industry first, sector first. Um, China is a huge sort of a footprint for manufacturing in the pharmaceutical space. So this will bring quite a bit of renewable energy purchase power to the manufacturers within China. And we estimated that each year with this um, agreement, we are able to reduce emission by 12,000 tons, and which is equal about taking 25,000 cars off the road. So you're having these conversations already. You're already entering into these partnerships. Mm -hmm. When you hear um, um, words from the Premier like this in terms of rebuilding that trust um, in all of these key areas, from climate to, to, to technology, um, and, and also trying to cross that north-south divide, um, what opportunities do you think that offers? I think there's immense opportunity. I mean, we are, China is a strategic market um, for AstraZeneca. We are in China for the world. Um, we've announced significant investments um, both in innovations and in technology. And most recently, we announced significant investments in Qingdao, or Shandong province, for example, to bring inhalation technologies and innovations um, to China, but also to supply beyond China, particularly in the emerging markets as well. So artificial intelligent data, for example, is also a key part of what we're trying to focus on um, in China. Now, there are also significant innovation happening within biotechs in China. China. So we have and will continue to partner with China Biotech to bring innovation to the world. Well, what about trade controls? I mean, do you worry that, that, that more countries are becoming inward looking and, and that the new rules for trade might actually hamper growth? Mm. So there are some challenges with trade, I have to admit. But overall, AstraZeneca is positive about global trade opportunity. Um, we do believe, we firmly believe that global leaders and policymakers, they understand medicine is for the people, no matter in China, United States, or in Europe. So we really need to come together to make sure that we safeguard that globalization of pharmaceutical supply chain. We need to drive that innovation. We need to drive, protect that intellectual property to make sure that we continue to innovate and we continue to deliver these medicines. Which brings me on to talking about climate change, arguably the biggest risk of the 21st century, um, which brings with it environmental health risks. Absolutely. So, so you know, how has that, do you think, accelerated change in the business? It, it, it's something that the, the Premier has touched on too. Significantly, right? I mean, AstraZeneca understands the interconnectivity between climate and health and also nature, right? Approximately 7 million people die every year due to air pollution. Another 5 million die due to extreme heat. And in the recent Lancet report late last year, it, it pointed out that if the t average t global temperature rises by two degrees versus the pre-industrial levels, the number of deaths associated with extreme heat will rise by 370%, daunting number. Now. You see the respiratory diseases, cancer, these are all mostly impacted by climate change, for example. So I think the healthcare sector really has the obligation to rise to the occasion, to be part of this innovation and solution to fight against climate change. But I do believe we need to really focus in two specific areas. One is decarbonization of the entire healthcare value chain. So it is not too late. How do we mitigate? How do we decarbonize from making of the medicines to the patient care um, pathways, for example? Number two is that early detection, screening of diseases for early treatment to keep patients out of the hospitals, um, for example. So I think these are when the industries come together above and beyond the sector, for example, we can make significant solutions that can scale. Well, AstraZeneca has some bold sustainability pledges. Absolutely. So you're committed to, to going green, but what about your partners? I mean, do you, you buy billions of dollars of, of materials and services from various Absolutely. firms right along the supply chain. Uh, so how do you get everyone on the same pathway as you? Absolutely. So as you mentioned, AstraZeneca has a 
big bull ambition on, on sustainability. We've announced a billion dollar flagship program called Ambition Zero Carbon. So our goal is by 2026, we actually will be net zero for scope one and two. And then for scope three, which is what you're talking about in, with the suppliers, by 2030, we will half the emissions um, with scope three, absolute reduction by 50%. So how are we going to do that? So I think this is where private-public partnership comes in play as well. SMI, um, the healthcare task force, once again, had actually established a joint target for minimum standards for suppliers. So that's encouraging the suppliers to adopt science-based targets to ensure that sustainability is at the heart of what they do. We within AstraZeneca, as you said, we buy billions of goods and services each year. We are already begun the journey working with our suppliers and really encouraging everyone to adopt that science-based target. We are prepared and ready to work with the suppliers to ensure that they are sustainable in what they do. And ultimately, we will only do business with those companies that are sustainable. That's a bold statement. Mm -hmm. I mean, look, you, you run the manufacturing network yes, at I AstraZeneca do. and moving away from fossil fuels to renewables is somewhat a preoccupation, but how cost effective, how equitable and how scalable is it really? That's a great question, Julie. So I'm in a unique position within the industry, actually beyond the industry where I wear a dual hat, right? I have an operational role, manufacturing supply chain and IT. At the same time, I'm also head of sustainability for the company. It's pretty cool in a way where I can build in sustainability into what we do. Right, so sustainability is part of our DNA. It's not a special project, it's not a special initiative, it's just part of what we do, right? To your point around renewables. Two to the matter is, if we're gonna accelerate net zero, if we're going to be net zero, we're gonna have to move away from fossil natural gas. And actually, as a matter of fact, we've signed um, collaborations with partners in the United States, in the UK, also in Sweden, to really adapt that renewable natural um, energy. And I give you that one specific example in the US. We signed a partnership with a company called Vanguard Renewables, where it's really about circular economy in motion, where we take farm waste and food waste, and we go through a dig uh, anaerobic digestion process, and we create biomethane that powers our R&D and manufacturing facility in the United States. So we have a big ambition. By 2026, all of our R&D and manufacturing facilities in the United States will be powered by biomethane. And as a matter of fact, as of June 1st of last year, we actually have a manufacturing site in Delaware that's already fully powered by biomethane. So these solutions exist, they are scalable, we are working with Vanguard Renewables now, leveraging AstraZeneca's technology, digital capability to increase productivity, to hopefully reach parity uh, in terms of the cost of biomethane and fossil natural gas. So imagine the power of that. Increasing collaboration in science and technology was one of Chinese Premier Li Chang's key messages in his speech here in Davos. But what might that look like in practice? I spoke to the Director General of the European Space Agency, Joseph Achenbacher, and German astronaut, Matthias Maurer, to find out. I mean, science and technology is, is driving innovation, is driving economies. So we see it very well in China, but also in Europe. We are really driving with a lot of innovation, a lot of projects, uh, and a lot is happening this year, 2024. Uh, we have a number of satellite launches with international partners of ESA missions of the European Space Agency. But one of the biggest uh, milestones this year for us at ESA is the launch of Ariane 6, which is the next generation of heavy launcher, uh, which will launch in summer this year. And in terms of future partnerships and collaboration with China, where are you at? Um, we're having actually quite a number of uh, cooperations with China. We, uh, China just launched the Einstein uh, probe, uh, which is uh, a fantastic uh, satellite to look at the X-ray of our universe. Uh, uh, as ESA, we have uh, collaborated with China uh, on the instrumentation. There are two instruments uh, on board uh, where we have uh, really provided significant support together with our uh, German partners. Uh, and this, by the way, congratulations uh, to China for its launch uh, just a couple of, uh, of days ago. So now the satellite obviously is in, in calibration validation. 
organization. Uh, but also we have another mission where we work together uh, with China, which is SMILE, um, which is uh, a mission where uh, our scientists uh, in ESTEC, uh, which is our center in the Netherlands, is uh, just testing together with Chinese uh, uh, engineers uh, the, the spacecraft, uh, right, making it ready for launch uh, probably next year. This is uh, uh, to, up to China to, uh, to decide. And we have other cooperations on uh, climate, uh, on Earth observation using space data, Earth observation data for climate monitoring. Climate is a global problem for everyone. Uh, everyone needs to participate. And uh, yes, uh, ESA, we have a, a very important program, uh, which is called the Copernicus program, where we disseminate data for free to the world. China is one of the big users, but also many other countries. 350 terabytes of data every single day given to the global community for free. Uh, this is uh, major. Uh, and there we uh, really look at the key problems of our planet, climate change. And that's how we found out that last year was, in fact, the, the warmest storm record by using that term Copernicus technology. Let's talk a little bit more about that Einstein probe mission, that collaboration, as you say, between ESA, China uh, and Germany. Um, how is it going to work? And why is it so important? Uh, it's a quite significant mission because it really scans uh, the, the universe for X-rays. Uh, X-rays uh, are coming through supernova explosions, uh, for example, or neutron star collisions. Uh, and then uh, massive amounts of X-ray are being uh, expelled into the, in the, into the universe. And this Einstein probe is actually measuring uh, these uh, signals uh, that, coming, that are coming from far away. So what we have uh, contributed as ESA uh, to this Einstein probe is um, actually on both on both instruments uh, on the what is called the, the follow-up uh, X-ray uh, uh, trans uh, uh, telescope. Uh, sorry, uh, the follow-up X-ray telescope and the wide X-ray telescope. So these are both instruments. One looks at a wider scale uh, and detects X-ray signals, and then the other one is really focusing in and looking at the smaller scale, but uh, really getting the signals more in detail. And there we have provided technology uh, testing uh, the mirror, uh, for example, is uh, coming from uh, from ESA. Uh, for one of the instruments, uh, but also we work on the ground segment uh, through the uh, reception of data, and uh, we provide science. Uh, uh, we get about 10% of the allocation of data for science purposes, and this is very important for our international cooperation. Well, I, I can feel how excited you are, um, and, and, and this is all from, from mission control. Um, but Matthias, it's also very exciting for you, isn't it, from someone who's actually been to uh, the International Space Station as part of the SpaceX Crew 3 mission. I mean, long heralded. Oh. As a, a real key um, collaboration in space. Where, where do you see the, the next collaboration coming from? Well, it's like on the ISS, we are in low Earth orbit, so we are working and doing experiments in zero gravity, which is really, really important because we can do certain type of experiments that we cannot do on planet Earth. So we can learn a lot, contribute to, uh, to medical advances in particular, but also in developing space hardware that we need for further exploration. And the next step to come will be to build up a station, a smaller station that flies around the moon. It's called the Gateway Station. And then from there to land on the surface of the moon and then to explore um, our neighbor. On the moon, we will learn a lot answer a lot of the fundamental questions that we have been asking like since ages, like uh, how does how did the solar system evolve, what's uh, out there to discover in the universe, how did the universe start. So it's like the moon um, science can contribute a lot of information on these big questions. And once we master like the moon and how to build a small station on the moon, how to make use of the resources on site, then we can also dare to venture out to Mars. Well, goodness me, all the way to Mars. But I want, I want to talk about um, going to the moon mm. and, and, and beyond, Joseph. You're, you're looking at how to get there. Um, and you're looking how to get there with a crew by 2028. I mean, this is big news. It's really big news because only three countries in the world have the capability to, to launch their own astronauts. The United States, Russia. I mean, we have a very long-standing and uh, excellent cooperation with NASA uh, since uh, many, many decades. In fact, what uh, we are contributing is uh, the European Service Module, uh, which is powering the Orion uh, Module, which uh, is the place where the astronauts are actually housed and uh, all the oxygen, the propulsion 
touched, and all this comes uh, from the European service module. Uh, in other words, uh, we are providing such an essential part of, uh, of, of uh, the Artemis mission being capable of bringing astronauts to the moon that without us they could not go. So in other words, uh, we are a very strong partner in this, uh, in this undertaking. And yes, uh, of course, uh, we are discussing, I'm discussing with NASA when a European astronaut uh, will be uh, going to the moon, uh, not only to the gateway, uh, which is the, this orbital station around the moon, but also to the surface. The date is not yet confirmed, by the way. Uh, we are still negotiating when this will be, uh, but certainly uh, my very strong belief and hope is uh, before the end of this decade, uh, but the dates are yet to be established. Why do you think there is this renewed global interest in, in getting to the moon and, and working out how to stay there? Oh, there's a lot to be done. I mean, first of all, the moon is our very next uh, celestial body. Uh, of course, everyone, as Matthias was just saying, is uh, looking up to the moon and uh, wondering what's up there and what's happening. And apart from curiosity, the moon will become a future economic zone. There will be a lot happening. Uh, there are many projects uh, going on. There's about 100 missions right now uh, going to the moon, uh, also ESA, we have several missions uh, going to the moon. Argonaut is uh, one of the biggest ones where we would like to uh, bring 1.5 tons of mass uh, to the moon for experiments, uh, for building up a station, uh, for transporting uh, uh, cargo uh, to the moon surface. Uh, we have another project called Moonlight, uh, which is quite exciting, where we establish uh, a navigation telecommunication system around the moon, just like the mobile phones on, on Earth are used to uh, make phone calls or to navigate. Uh, in the future, we will offer the same around the moon, uh, that you have uh, your mobile phone or your device on the moon, and astronauts or uh, robots uh, can uh, make use of that. So we will provide the, in the infrastructure of a navigation telecommunication satellites. So a lot is happening. There's also, of course, uh, war. Uh, Water, which is on the south pole of the moon, uh, and this is a very precious uh, resource. Uh, not only you can use the water, but you can convert it into oxygen, into fuel to go further out into the universe, to the solar system, to Mars and beyond. So there's a lot happening. Uh, there are resources on the moon's surface, and all this uh, needs yet to be explored. We talk about resources on the moon surface. I know the water is very important. But Matthias, you also trained as an astrobiologist. So, um, is that going to help us find food and, and, and grow food from Mars and from the moon? Yeah, I don't think we will find food on the moon on the moon surface. But definitely, having the water is an important asset. And the water that's now on the on the polar regions on the moon, it got there like millions of years ago, and and basically. Um, it got there at the same time that also water and uh, organic molecules came from space also to planet Earth. So the beginning of life on planet Earth is also like frozen inside this ice. So we want to get to this water ice to uh, learn about our past and how planet Earth became into such a habitable planet as we know today. <coughs> It's all such exciting stuff. And of course, in 2025, you've got your next space summit. You know, many missions may have happened by then. Many may be still um, in the pipeline. I mean, what do you think the main talking points and the main themes you think are going to dominate the, the, the news agenda? Well, there's a, a large number of topics, uh, but let me say, on one side, we use space technology to look uh, at our planet Earth. About 50% of the budget of uh, the European Space Agency is used for planet Earth. That means uh, climate change, uh, Earth observation, telecommunication, navigation. And then, of course, there's the, the dream of going outside to the moon, to Mars, and beyond. Uh, and there we have uh, a number of exciting projects coming up. Actually, one of the missions, um, quite exciting, is HERA. Uh, HERA will look at the uh, impact of the DART mission uh, on an asteroid. Uh, so in other words, uh, we would like to see how we could in the future prevent that an asteroid is coming to our planet. Uh, as we know, the dinosaurs have been extinguished uh, most likely because of an asteroid impact. Uh, so their whole uh, species has been uh, disappearing because of this impact. Of course, we don't want this to happen to humankind. Uh, so we would like to see whether our space uh, technology ca could eventually uh, divert uh, one of these asteroids if it would come to planet Earth. Uh, so there's a lot of exciting stuff happening and uh, yes, uh, 24, 25 are very important moments for us in the European Space Agency. Well, I've, it's been fantastic talking to both of you. An out of this world conversation I could talk to you all day. We have to leave it there. Thank you both so much. Thank, Thank you. you. <laughs> Remember, you can subscribe to this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. 
You can also find more agenda content on CGTN Europe's Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Telegram and YouTube channels. Until next time, goodbye. The most interesting questions. Are there other living beings beyond Earth? Will man or machine be in charge? Great question. Always have more than one answer. Well, hold on, uh, let me just draw up a list. And always come from more than one person. That's where the credibility lies. The concept of having a machinery which is alive and evolving didn't wait for us. The end of inequality of incomes and wealth around the world, can you imagine how difficult that is at the moment to achieve? Every episode, Stephen Cole, Murray Beveridge, and some of the brightest minds out there shed light on the answers to some of the most intriguing questions. There are two ways of looking at this. Machines can't really discriminate between civilian and military targets. The Answers Project. Maybe we need to just look at this in a bit more detail. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence. The Answers Project, a new podcast from CGTN Europe.